This information is brought to you by Charles Sturt University. Oh my god, it started! I hope I'm editing that. Oh, really? There's no editor there. Oh, that's a shame. Every, all the distance students, no one hate me. But who's this dumb idiot who gets sad when you try and do stuff for his double infinite? <laughs> so you make YouTube videos that like dumb idiot tries to understand discrete maths fails gone wrong. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> <go on>. um, <laughs> all right, so today I wanted to talk about your exam and then go through the the sample exam or one of them. So um, firstly, I just want to point out where some of the information is for it. I sent an announcement last night. Did anyone get it? Okay, that's good. So um, the key things under assessment items. Um, it's just here, just explains about the exam, which I'll talk through in a second. Um, the main things you'd want to have from this is there's a example formal sheet here, um, which you don't have to use, but and so some two sample exams, which I'll go through in a second, um, and some answers for them as well. So let's just have a look at this paper and then talk through some of these. So the front page of this sample exam looks pretty much like yours does. Um, so it's exactly the same. Oh, it doesn't say sample exam. Look at you guys. But, um, right, otherwise, fairly similar. So um, you can see that it's it's a closed book exam, so you can't take textbooks in, but you are allowed to take in um, double-sided notes, one page, one eight four page double-sided note. And you can have anything you want at all. So it can be printed, it can be handwritten, or a bit of both. So they are okay. So the person who works there, if you allow them or not, is the invigilator, not me. And they've got no idea what the subject's about. So as long as it's two side, one double A for it, side piece of paper with anything on it, they're okay. So put poetry if you wish on there. Uh, but I suggest focus on the, on the math. So I do have to put a, an example um, formula sheet together. Um, which, if you can read it, fantastic. So we're allowed to just print out that. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. So, and I mean, I've, I've left some space here, right. so you could scribble some things in that. If you want to print this out and just add some stuff. So, in my other sort of subjects that I do this sort of stuff, what lots of students do is they will print that out, um, reduce it down to say one page, and have good eyesight, I hope. And um, then on the other side, write down any examples they want to. Can you bring a magnifying glass in? Yes. Oh. Yes. You do on your face. That's <laughs> not how it works. It corrects the vision. It doesn't enhance it. Just take your glasses off, is it? Or... Oh, I can't see anything. <laughs> so, um, it's important to think about what you guys want on this um, sheet. So, um, I put lots of things. I put lots of definitions for graph theory, etc. Um, and I put lots of the definitions for the for lean out for set theory and, and logic as well, and names of the rules. So I, you know, I have made two revisions of this during the session. So if you download it towards the beginning of the session, I've added a few things. So the main things is I fixed up an error. I don't remember where it was anymore. And I put a few more definitions into the graph theory. Um, so. So you can take it if you want to, or do something else to go and get it. But it is important to think about what you guys need, and this may not satisfy. It's a good summary for me, but it may not be so useful for you. And so you need to think, oh, actually, I need some extra stuff on there. So did I have I put a quadratic formula on here? Um, yes, I did. Quadratic formula is pretty useful, for example. Um, and so I know some things which you don't, so I've put them on there if you need and at times I might waste space stuff going on that already. So get liquid and paper and wipe it down and write something else at the top. Okay. But bring something in, because there's no I don't expect you have to remember every single formula. There's no point doing that. Um, and so you're allowed to work write word examples down as well if that's helpful, etc. So that is it. So you're allowed to 
that double side A4 piece of paper. Um, you also have a lot of calculator. Um, so bring it in. So having a calculator is a really, really good idea. Um, some questions like counting and probability, I will accept, you know, um, answers like 10 times 9 times 8 rather than, work at, rather than writing 720 down. So I will, if, you know, that's quite clearly understand what the process is. Just too late typing your calculator. We forgot your calculator, your calculator's run out of batteries, any of those sort of things. I still give you full marks. But it's still useful to have it in there for your, for your benefit. Um, so certainly subbing in things like um, recurrence relations, you might find the calculator pretty handy to do that stuff for you, for example. So bring one in. Um, you don't get to keep the question paper. So it's a three hour um, and 10 minute exam. So the intention is you spend three hours writing and 10, hour, 10 minutes beforehand reading. That's not enforced, as in you can write the whole time. You can really just a three hour, 10 minute exam. So despite that, despite you can write any time you want to, it's still a good idea to read through the whole paper at the beginning. So just to see what's there, you might go, oh, question one looks really hard, but question two, that's OK, I'll start with that one. And you can start do questions out of order. And often if you just get your confidence going through what you think an easier question, um, you might then be able to go back to what you seem to be the harder question and be OK with it. Come back later. Make sure you do come back, though. And if you do, if you do questions out of order, make it really clear to mark out what you're doing so they can know to look for it. Especially if you leave a page blank. If you're going to leave a page blank, say, you know, put a please turn over at the bottom just so they know to keep going. So it's not the end of the paper. They do try, but, you know, give them every chance to give as many marks as you possibly can. Um, so there are five questions. So the five questions correspond to the five different topics we've done. So question one is on sets and logic and proofs. Um, number two is on counting different bases and probability. Number three is on uh, graph theory. Four is that assignment you just, you just put in. I hope you just put in. And number five is on building algebra. So they're the five sort of questions. Each of them are worth 20 marks each. So unlike this sample exam, um, the marks per question will be indicated in your paper. So question one's worth 20 marks, and each of these parts would be that's worth five marks or whatever it might be. Uh, and so you can use that as a gauge for how long you want to how, you, how long you want to spend on a question, for example. Um, so it's 100 marks, um, all up. So you can use it as a guide if you wish or not. That gives you the some intention of what I, how much value I see for various stuff. Um, so, and it's a must-pass exam, so you've got to get at least 50% of this exam. Um, so basically all those assignments have been trying to um, equip you so you can do this one well. So if you've missed out an assignment or don't really buy it, bomb an assignment, it's okay. You can learn from it, it's a whole point of them. But you do have to try to do this well, this one. So some caveats, um, if you fail the exam, but get at least 40%, 5% overall, then you do get a second chance for an additional exam. So it's not the end of the world. Just need to get, um. hmm? just need to get a few percent in the exam and just do it again. So it's better just to pass it, but um, people often get really anxious and knowing some of this and fall fallbacks. Uh, fallbacks is often useful. So um, if you repeat it, will it be the exact same exam? No. That would be damn. damn. I would I would fail just to repeat. I would it. do that as well. <laughs> well, if you get an additional exam, the highest grade you can get after that's a pass. So for you, if you're aiming for HD, um, it wouldn't go very well. I don't know why you say that about me. Yeah, aiming for HD. Like you're really picking on me a bit here. That's a lot of pressure. You're hoping that HD carries you to at least a credit after the exam. Well, no. apparently stood you on a distinction. So like overall, so. Anything less than a credit, and I'll be pretty sad. <laughs> so yes, and again, don't aim for getting, don't aim for 51% overall. Because if you fire, if you miss your mark slightly, then you're in trouble. Please get the grease, bro. So you aim for 60 at least, is my suggestion. But anyway, um, <laughs> so some other things. These sample exams, which I'm about to go through, um, 
based on all, our old exam papers. I can't remember how long. I say more than 10 years ago. Um, so the contents changed slightly and the context of the subjects changed slightly since then. So these exams were originally six questions long, so I've just deleted question four out of them, essentially, which is on three geometry. So that they were three or six questions in three hours, so that's five questions in three hours. Wait, was, but did you used to do 3D geometry in this subject? Yep. Wow. That sounds fun. It, it kind of does, but it also sounds like it'd be okay. it, it, sound, it doesn't sound like discrete mathematics. Um, yeah, but it sounds like fun, though. No, 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 I agree, I agree. And so that's sort of been moved to ITC 363. Oh, we don't even do that. Huh? You can. Oh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> What's an elective? <laughs> um, What's the name of that subject, do you know? Graphics, maybe? <laughs> Something like that. So it's right. 320's the other one, which is advanced graphics, but right? that might be better name. Oh, yeah, that's in the, uh, the specialisation thingy. Yeah. So it's graphics and advanced graphics, sort of. Go through more of that. Yeah, um, oh, so, so, yeah, so, that, so the, the question, this was, a, so the, so the exam is really shorter than it used to be, which is a bonus for you guys. Um, the context also has changed. So when these exam, when these sample exams were originally written, students used to do maths 101 before it, when most of you haven't done it that way. And so there's a few questions like determinants in there, um, which would, would have been fine 10 years ago, but not today. And so I'll mention that as we go through it. Um, right, the context has changed slowly. So there's a few questions which aren't quite appropriate anymore. Despite those things, it's still a good way of practicing. The other thing is your exam has slightly less volume than this as well. So there's still five questions, but I've um, sometimes have done less parts in the questions as well. So in, in question one, will there just be part A? No, it's more than that. Oh, okay. Does that mean yeah. each question has like more weight, or like each part of each question has more weight? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And it still it still has reasonable breadth to it. Um, so in that sense, it oh. might be a little easier. I mean, it's not really. It just means there's a little less time pressure, which is the key thing, um, which is useful, I think. So not being so pressured for time is useful. Um, I have put in a few tricky questions, not many of them, but a few. So they're not if you're feel like you're only just on the edge between pass and credit or whatever it might be, or pass and fire, then those questions you can just happily ignore. That's okay. Um, they're really up there for the HC, question, HC sort of students, so, which some of you are aiming for, which is good. So there's, not, there's, a, there's a few just to separate the higher grades out, but they aren't that many. So if you see one or two really tricky ones, go, yeah, that's okay, but hopefully you don't see the whole exam that way. <laughs> We were both in trouble. Too, too <coughs> so that's sort of the um, sort of overview of the exam. Um, and so, um, as I said, make sure you read through it just to see what you're expecting. You can read through it with a pencil in hand, and you can stir <laughs> things. So you can make some comments as you you go. Oh, you can remember something as you're reading it. Um, so make some notes if you wanted to. So um, let's try some questions out. So as you can see, question one here is similar to your first assignment. Was it? I don't remember that far back. Um, so you have to, so you can see it's the first, it was about some stuff involving sets, something involving logic, and something involving proofs is what this one is. Um, and they sort of reasonable things to do. So. Let's do some questions. So, so with proving stuff involving sets or Boolean algebra or logic, which are all similar sorts of stuff, you have various things you can you can do to prove it. So some questions I'll leave up to you how you want to do it. Um, other times I will force you to do one particular way. So this one says use Venn diagrams, which are probably the easy way anyhow. Um, but if you have a choice, pick whatever you want to find easier. Um, so the things that are, I think are useful to know is Venn diagrams, truth tables, which you can use for this even if you were 
um, were clever enough, or thoughtful enough how to do it, and um, using the rules for Boolean, bull, rules for Boolean algebra essentially. So anyway, how would you prove this one? So I use Venn diagrams to show that particular statement. What's the name of that statement, by the way? Yeah, so it's De Morgan's law, which is why they didn't ask prove using the rules. You'd say it's one of the rules. How do you demonstrate using Venn's diagram? Venn's diagrams. Well, you can have two circles which overlap inside a big box. Okay, so basically you draw two pictures which look exactly the same as you described. Did the question. Cool marks. <laughs> and then on the first one you show where A and B are. Yep. The overlap. That's A and B, yep. And then it's not that, so it's everything else. Everything else. So basically you do two diagrams, as you're correctly saying, one for the left-hand side and one for the right-hand side, and you're just trying to build it up and show the pictures are the same. Um, I didn't quite do it properly. Let's kind of pick that up. Right-hand side. And for the other one, you've got not A, so everything that isn't A, or the circle on the left. Yep. And not B, which is everything that's not B. And you should just have that little overlap in the middle, which is whatever's left. And so the if I've done it well, which I'm convinced I've done that properly, that um, this is not A and, or not B, and so it colours everything but, let's just say, the overlap in the middle. And you can see that the, the red area on the left hand side and the, the compliant um, cross hatching on the right hand side of the same region. So, sentence to explain. So essentially, you, won't, you might, probably won't get exactly the same question. So you, how you do it, you draw a diagram for the left hand side, the right hand side separately, make it label enough so people understand what you're doing, there's lots of ways of doing that, and then just write a sentence to explain what it says, which pretty much aligns of the pictures on the left and the right are the same. So therefore, left hand side equals right hand side. So you can be more creative with the words than that. So that's a bit of Venn diagrams. And Venn diagrams are really useful. Even if you have to prove things using the rules, Venn diagrams still can be helpful just to give you an idea of what's happening sometimes. I have a question about this. Yep. So for um, part two, it says use any law of sets you like but not Venn diagrams. Could you then use a truth table for that? Or you have to explain how you do that. Because then for the next one it says use truth tables and then one after that, but not truth tables. Could you then use a Venn diagram or something similar for that one? Is that possible or is it just the type of question just excludes that? So I, I, I've worded it differently in your exam. So in this one I guess you could, make, you could perhaps argue otherwise, but in your exam you won't be. Like a little star that says, I'll oh, refer to the bottom of the page, no vendor. No, I, no, I'll just say, you must use the rules of William Howard or something like that. <laughs> right, okay. Or rules of logic or the rules of set theory. So basically, Small I need steps. to bring a brick or something to knock myself over the head with when I start this exam. Oh, I, I think you No, I mean, I'm not trying to be unreasonable. So I'm not going <laughs> to. So I'm not going to ask 50 questions without proving stuff. Of, um, involving these sort of rules. Just bring in someone who knows what they're doing to do the exam. So, so most questions <laughs> actually, most questions I'll actually give you the choice. I'm warned. And I'm not going to be restricted most of the time. I do I'm want you to there. understand the rules of the answer, so I will assess them. So don't be surprised if there's a question on it, but there's not heaps of them either. For that matter. Even try, David. You watch JoJo's. Okay, so this one is um, prove something using the. Um, the rules of set. So basically, I'd start with one side, whatever you think is more complicated, and then simplify it eventually so that equals right hand side and bottom. That's sort of the basic approach. And each step, you want to use one of the rules of Boolean algebra, or effectively one of the rules of sets, um, to basically move it at a time. And you try to do one rule per line, it's a basic idea. 
if you combine a few simple ones together, that's fine. So I just picked the left-hand side. That's why I reckon more complicated, but it's pretty arbitrary in this case. What rule would you use to try to simplify or change it? Same one of the distributive laws or something like that. I don't know. I can't remember all the names of the alcoholics. I know what you're trying to do, but I can't. Are we, are we doing the right hand side or are we doing the left hand side? I picked left hand side. Oh, okay. Do the other way around. Oh, it's a lot easier to make the left hand side look like the right hand side, I think. I would have done the right hand side because I'm dumb. But no, no, no. It, it, well, they're both. It doesn't really matter. So um, the first thing I'd see is I've got to. Times all the brackets out and. Which is like distributive, isn't it? In terms of brackets. Okay, so the distributive law is just expanding the brackets out. So we'll do that, what you said. Yeah, there we go. So that's the distributive property. Now, if you forget on the day what the name of it is, and just say expanding brackets, that's okay too. Like it. And just demorgans it. Then when you've got a knot of other stuff, De Morgan's law is a good idea. So what does De Morgan's mean again? Just switch up a whole bunch of stuff. So you just did a knot of the individual part and swap the operator? Yeah. So we look, we go, going, well, we're close. So this part and that part already match up, which is nice. Do the same thing to the first so you just need to fix that first one up. So you demorgan the first bit on turn. So I do demorgan's the second time. The knot of each part. Swap the operator. Shazam. And are we there? Yeah. No, because I no. forgot to make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> which is not a bad idea. You just go, let's just see if it. It doesn't actually quite match up, so I made a mistake. Um, I used another rule. I used the Morgan's Law. I used something else there at the last line, though. Can someone tell me what else I did? Math. <laughs> a little bit more precise, isn't it? The cancelling out the not law. Hmm? Is it the cancel? Yeah, so it's called the double complement. That that'll work. I always thought that was just like common knowledge. I didn't really think about it as a law. I was just like... <laughs> so I'm happy for you to take it as, as common knowledge, though. And often you just do it with other stuff. So if you didn't mention double complement, that's OK. But I do, as you can see here, I want you just to be able to do the steps. I want you to put enough work in to explain to, what other, to other people what you've done. If you miss a few of the minor ones, like double complement or associative or commutative, which is basically rearranging how it's in the page, um, that's OK. But writing in the other ones are, really, are pretty useful. And if you use synonyms like expanding or factorising rather than distributive, again, that's OK. So I'm not, going to, I'm not, really, not super fussy in these things, but I do want you to be able to communicate what you've done. That is still important. And that's not the only way of doing it. And I should say equals right-hand side at the end to say you're finished. So first one is using truth tables, um, and the second one is using laws of logic. So that part two, essentially, is a very similar idea to the one above. So truth tables. Basically, do P and Q, um, write down all the values. Tilt P. So, we want to try to show two expressions of the same. So, first one we want to look at is P implies Q, and the other one we want to build is not P or Q. Tilt P. Tilde. Just read it as not in this context, but yeah. Um, 
And so in order to build that expression up, you probably need to know what not P is in the first instance. So Approximately P. Um, so to do it. So let's do um, P implies Q. What's the truth table for P implies Q? You should yeah, basically write answers. Zero is a one. So one zero one. So one one zero one. That's right. So pretty much if P's on, then Q has to be on. If P's off, who cares? So if P's off, the first two, that's okay. If P's on and Q's off, that's wrong. But for the zero there, the last one's okay. So that's the truth table for P implies Q. Um, so that's the one. We've got to see if we match up to that one. Not P would be just to swap the P's or the values of the zeros and ones. And we want it or we want to and it even. Um, or it. So not P and Q, we want all these two. So if one of them's on, turn it on. And so the or of those two things gives you that table. And so since these two columns are the same, these match. So expressions are equivalent. So again, for a, a more, so in your assignment, if you remember back that far for your first assignment, the corresponding question in your assignment had a more complicated expression. Um, and so it required a few more extra columns you had to generate. And I could ask this, I'm, I could ask the same sort of thing in your exam. So just be prepared for that. I'm not. I don't try to. I mean, I try to go more overboard in the summons than exams. Just be prepared to write out 32 ones and zeros in a truth table. That smile says yes. Oh, well, no. There's, there's five variables. No. <laughs> you can let me know. Anyone you want to sit exam next week. Um, oh, it's true. It's getting your one and zero ready. hand ready. It's true, I can see it already. So uh, let's use the rules of logic to prove some other stuff. So uh, the imply sort of operator, um, you can translate it to other sort of systems quite easily, but it, we see it more commonly in the logic sort of say. So, um, so we've got this. Uh, what does tautology mean again? Um, so we have to prove it's a tautology. You've shown what that means. Um, has to be uh, true or false. A proposition is either true or false. Oh, so it, it can be, be true. Sorry, yeah, it can be true or false. So tautology means it's always true. Oh, yeah, it has to be always true. true. I got it so the other words that we use at the same time is contingent. What does that mean? That's true. Or false. Can be either, depend. <laughs> and the other one is contradiction. That's always false. Which is always false. So the one that's hardest to remember probably is the word tautology. So tautology means always true. It reminds me of food for some reason. Okay. <laughs> um, so we always say you want to we wanna try to say we got the expression, we want to do a bunch of lines to get equal to true at the bottom, that's what we're trying to go for. So it's what tautology. So what sort of things we want to do, and they said they've got a hint here, so let's try to use it. So the hint is to use well, just the definition for, in, for implication a second ago. So the implication is either um, not of the premise or the conclusion that's what we just had a second ago. So, premise implies conclusion is not the premise or the conclusion. So we've just done here. So that's that. That's the definition of implication, really. Or part I in this instance. So I've just used the hint. What would you do next? Write a truth table because you don't want to do that. So, that positively, what are we going to do next? Um, well, if you expand the not out, use the De Morgans. So I'm going to use De Morgans. De Morgans, yes. So it's not P or not Q. And then because it's all knots, you can 
get rid of the brackets. Sorry, so because they're all, all, all the same operator, or so you can get rid of the brackets. You can drop the brackets and move things around if you wanted to. And then you should have not P or P or Q. Q. So you allowed to reorder. And, the re and then the cubic names, you want to know why you allowed to do that. The, the dropping the brackets is the associative rule. And the moving things around, like the order wise, is called the community property. Now, I'm just happy for you to do that. I mean, it sort of just looks pretty obvious, thing, sort of things that I have to do. But they're the fancy names if you wanted to know them. Um, so we just, re we just rewrote it. Why are we right if we rewrite it that way? Can someone else tell me? Because. Not someone else? Sorry. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Awesome. Why can you do that with the brackets? Why no, no, no. Like why that? did we do that? Oh, What's our next the, step? Why oh, did we arrange it that way? You, you got a non-P and a, or a P, and they just, that's just get rid of it. So this yeah, thing here on, obviously simplifies down something nicely. That's why we did that way. It comes true. It does become true. That's and true. It true. It's, it's so it's either true. if something's happening or not happening, well, one of that. So that's definitely true. Um, that'd be true for the same reason. Well, that we need to know. It's true or true. <laughs> so that's called the complement property. It's false. And true or true is true by take a pick. Item potent, for example. Or identity properties, there's a few of them. Name for that. And what does that say? Well, that's exactly what we need to do. It's always true. So it's always true, so therefore it is or tautology just like we wanted it to be. <laughs> so I said, if you miss a few things, like if you didn't write those words down, if you didn't know what they're called, that's okay. But you can try to do this other ones. Or, um, if you give it a go, I'd probably write the other ones down. If you don't know what the names are, the example form sheet has those written down. That's a, one way of seeing what they might be. Any questions with that? one is define a rational number. What does that mean? One time we go. See if you can write down um, on your piece of paper what you reckon the definition of a rational number is. The second thing is um, if x and y are, so if x is a rational number, y is an irrational number, what sort of number is x plus y? What do you reckon? So have a guess on your piece of paper. Have a go guessing an answer. We'll go and do the proof bit together. But I want you to see if you can do the um, first two parts. Down for what? If, if x is rational, my writing's bad today. If x is rational, if x is what? It terminates or repeats based on Jono's definition, which I can agree with. It runs as a fraction. So we're going to be able to use the definition in a second. A fraction. Uh, <laughs> it can be all. You can get 7 on 22, yeah. which is. 
quadrus. So I find it easier in a second to use the fraction definition. So if x is equal to a on b, well, a and b are integers. And I guess b not zero would be a good thing to exclude, but not so important. So it's it's easiest probably in the end of the day to write it as a as a ratio of two integers. So your definition of it's a it's decimal format either terminates or recurs is correct. That is actually correct. Um, but it may not be so useful when you have to try to prove things within a second. Um, so that's a definition. If x is rational, what does irrational mean, by the way? What's this so the opposite of that. Yep, so not rational. Yeah, yeah, it means you can't express it. Yep, correct. So if x is rational and y is irrational, what's the sum going to be? Irrational. So, um, now we're to prove it. Let's write down pi plus 4. There we go. Okay, you can't prove it Done. by example. It's only not one example only. So that's called proof by example, which is, uh, in it, which is invalid. <laughs> Because you already found, okay, that works for one case, but maybe there's some other example you can come up with where yeah, you can try and find that. Yeah, um, so, you, you so you have to do a different sort of technique. So we've got different ways of trying to prove things. So you've got is an implication. And so you can try to prove it directly. So the direct approach would be I've got two premises, combine them together, do a bit of work, and therefore show x plus y must be irrational. Um, that doesn't work so well in this case, and the reason is x is rational is well, actually got a nice well-defined definition. We know that x equals a on b, that's okay. Um, the problem is um, y is irrational is a bit of a harder expression to deal with, and x plus y is irrational is a harder expression to deal with. So it's actually easier to deal with the opposites of those things. So when it starts easier to deal with the opposites, you need to start thinking of some of the indirect approaches. And so the two indirect approaches we dealt with is the contrapositive um, or the proof by contradiction. So the, so the contrapositive is basically assume that the conclusion is false, do a bunch of work, and then show the premises are false, or the, whole, the premise is false. That's a contrapositive, which is the same as proving that directly. Um, the other way, which I'll we'll try here, is um, a proof by contradiction. So I'm going to, tr I'm going to do um, proof by contradiction. So the basic idea is you assume the premises. So I'll fill it out. So the red is sort of the, the basic template. Um, so assume conclusion is false is the starting point. So in this particular instance, so we're going to say x is rational and y is irrational. So that's assuming the premises are true. So we're just taking it verbatim. Um, then we're assuming the conclusion is false. So what's the conclusion? X and y is irrational. So x plus y is rational. What's the opposite of that? Is rational. Okay, so the conclusion, well basically, if we assume that conclusion is false, we're really assuming that x plus y is rational. So we're assuming the opposite is true, essentially what we're doing. Um, and it's always good to say what you're doing, to like yourself as well as the marker, and that's where you're aiming for a contradiction. So that little link line there says to the reader, or in the mark in your case for exam, what technique you're trying to do, essentially. That's your proof technique. Now I've written the top, but that's also the, the, the normal signpost for it. Okay. So the next thing is we need to do a bunch of steps. Which isn't very that's the basic that is the technique. Um, and after a while Get a, get a contradiction. 
So we need to do a few things with what we've got and eventually till we get the situation of saying, well, no matter what we have to look at it, it's always just completely false at that point in time and therefore um, as planned we've got our contradiction and therefore the result, the original result must be true. Um, then we'll put a conclusion at the end. As I said, basic idea, assume premises, assume conclusions false, work, do a bunch of steps till we get until we get error, it's always been false, and then you say, fantastic, that's what we actually wanted to do, and then write a conclusion and say, we've done it, essentially. So what does it look like in this case? Okay, so we've got x is rational, we can deal with that. So x is equal to a plus b, where a and b are integers. Hmm? A over b, you said false. Okay, a over b, sorry, yep. Uh, the other one that's easy to do with this one here, we've got x plus y is rational, we can do that one too. So x plus y is equal to say p over q, where p and q are integers. So I'm just picking the easy one. So the y is irrational is a bit harder to deal with, so I'm just leaving that, for the, I'm leaving that one last. So I guess that since that's the one I got last, how about I just try to work at what what y would be based on what I already have? So y would be equal to x plus y minus x. That seem okay. Which is equal to p on q minus a on b. Just plugging in the expressions I know. And I can write that in terms of one fraction. So that would be um, PB minus AQ over Q times by B. Is that all right? Um, which is equal to an integer divided by an integer. So therefore, it's going to be a rational number. So what I've done is I've just combined the two things together. So essentially, going back to how I did it, is I look at the top, I go, well, I've got two sums. They're easy to convert things into. So I just write down some definitions for it. The one that's hard, this one here, I'm just leaving alone for the moment, that's the one I have to try to get the contradiction with, essentially. That's the only last one around. So I just spell out what it means, x and x plus y to be rational, combine them together to try to get this contradiction involving y somehow or other. So touch them together, and I've seen by a few steps to show that y is rational. Um, but this contradicts that y is irrational. So we've got a contradiction, that's what we're aiming for. It's good. Could you just say that this contradicts the premise? The premise, two parts of the premise. So in your exam, yeah, I'll take it. I mean, you got the idea. If you got to this stage in your exam, then you understand enough that I'm happy with it. Um, but there's two premises, so it's probably it's clearer if you identify which one it is. Okay. But I would know what you're talking about. Um, and so we've got the contradiction. That's good. So then a conclusion, therefore, original result is true. Essentially, so we've got the proof by contradiction. Okay, so we haven't done heaps. So you did a few, we did a few of these proofs at the beginning. So that proof by contradiction in your what was it? So I think you did a proof by contradiction or someone. Um, well, that was one way of doing it. So uh, some some tips to get some marks. So these would be worth. I don't know, about five marks, perhaps just a question like this in the exam. Um, so out of your, out of a hundred. Even if you can't do the whole thing, it's you can get a few easy marks. So if you look at it, a shorty now I can assume the premises and I can assume the conclusion solves. Those two bits are easy to do that are are easier to do. Right? You probably could do those two parts, writing them on a piece of paper, and get some marks just from that. This bit in the middle, that might be a bit harder for you to do. 
And so you might not get, so if you're really weak in this area, you may not get anything in the middle, but you can at least get start, which might be two marks. And even if you say, look, I'm going to do something in the middle here, I'm going to get it equal to be false at the end, and then put the conclusion out, so you might be able to do that part too. Now, it depends how much you've got in the paper. It's not much else in between at all. It might be difficult to give you any marks. But, I can give, but if you put it at least the top, if you know you're supposed to be doing, the, if you know enough at the top to indicate what type of method you're doing, you're showing some knowledge, therefore that's worth marks. That really is. So don't get, so my, so so many questions might get harder from your point of view. Don't just leave it blank. I can't give you anything for that. Put down something. Um, now, if it's really vague, I have to think, the mark has to think hard if they're going to give you any marks. But if you do some clear stuff, he's going, I know the proof by condition starts this way, I think that's definitely worth something. Um, so that's it. Um, that's why I want to try to stress those sort of things too. So in my formula sheet, I have, I've got a brief description about the proof ideas in here that may be very unhelpful for you or helpful, I don't know. But um, it's not about to have, to have to understand at least the basic process, so I know we just need to start from. So you can see here, assume the conclusion's false and do some various things. So there's just some tips about how to do it. And again, even if you can't get the whole thing, at least start it. So that was one um, proof in this particular exam. This is another one. What sort of proof technique is this one about? It's a pain at the backside, but you've got, um, you show for, well in this case you show for n equals 1, Assume for n equals k and then prove for n equals k plus Okay, so this is induction, and it's, it's nice enough to tell you to you. And the way to do induction, as you're correctly saying, is um, you show true for the base case. So you've got to work, show it's true for the base case, so you've got to have a starting point. So n equals 0, n equals 1, something along those lines. It would be fine in this case. Um, then you assume true for some arbitrary value, n equals k, say. Um, from that, so this is the energy assumption, um, use assumption to prove for n equals k plus 1. If you can do that, so if you've got a base case, and you've got this bit, so that bit's called the inductive step, so those two things together are called the inductive step, so we've got base case and the inductive step, then that automatically shows the results true for all values of n starting from the base case going onwards. So then you just put a conclusion on the bottom saying, I've got it right, essentially. The basic structure, do the base case. Now, the inductive step tends to be the hard place. The base case tends to be not fairly straightforward. So if you've got one of these questions, at least do the base case. So that's a good starting point. And it shows you know where you're going to where you start from and you at least pick up an easy mark there. So you can do n equals zero or n equals one, both would be fine in this instance. It does depend on the context. Um, so it doesn't really matter. I'll pick n equals zero because like it's easy to sub into. So let's give it a name. So let's call it E for E n is my expression I'm considering. So my expression when I plug in n equals 0 is equal to what? So if I plug in n equals 0 into that, what do I get? 9. So I get 0 plus 1 cubed plus 2 cubed, which you say is 9. Now, what do we need to show that this expression does? It's divisible by 9. It's divisible by 9. So, um, so this is clearly divisible, divisible by 9. It's it's done. done. We did that so, day. Anyway, the word clearly is, I think, appropriate there. Yeah. Um, so it's done. So one mark. Go um, Not go home yet. Oh. <laughs> so that's the that's the base case. Now we have to prove. Now we have to do the next thing. Now the next line again 
is an easy mark if you know which, uh, if you know the process. Next line is assume that the result is true for n equals k. So assume that um, e to k is divisible by nine. That's a basic assumption. Now let's make it a little bit easier to work with. So e to k means you've got k cubed plus k plus 1 cubed plus k plus 2 cubed. That's what we've got. That's divisible by 9. What does it mean to be divisible by 9? Is equal to what? So 9a or something. Yep, so 9a, where a is an integer. So again, that's another mark. So if you tell me clearly what the assumption is, so that, that tells me you understand the logic of this sort of proof type. So you haven't really done that much work there, but you know what you're supposed to be doing, and that's worth your marks. So they're the easy parts. Now comes the harder part, relatively speaking. And that is I need to try to prove it for k plus 1. So I want to consider e k plus 1. So I need to basically show this is divisible by 9 as well. And the key way of doing it is I need to try to use my assumption somehow. Or other. I need to use that result there to try to prove it. That's the whole point of induction. <coughs> so ek plus 1, basically let's replace all the k's by k plus 1. So I get k plus 1 cubed plus k plus 1 plus 1 u plus k plus 2 plus 1 cube. That's what my expression I'm considering. So I should replace the k with k plus 1. So I would like to try to use what I've circled in green. Can you see how I can use it at all? Well, if you just expand out the first if you expand the last oh, I don't want to expand things just yet, if I can. Oh, you could. Well, if you... Yeah, okay. So if you expand the last one, we'll do that. I should listen, shouldn't I? So... I would do it differently, but it still works, so let's do it. So if you expand the last one out, what do you get? You know, nine. Plus nine. So um, when you... 9k squared plus 10k plus... 37k cubed plus 27. 18. Isn't it just 18k because you've already got the. You wouldn't need a 27k cubed. Oh, should we just k? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cubes. So when you expanded that out, um, the thing I presumably you guys noticed is that part there matches up to that part there. That Which is the whole reason for doing that. So that's equal to 9a plus the rest of it using the assumption. Take out a common factor of 9. And what are we trying to do? Just trying to remind ourselves what are we trying to do with this thing? Uh, we want to prove it's divisible by 9. How do you prove it's divisible by 9? So pretty much show it's equal to 9 times by something or other. Well, that would do it. Take 9 out of it then. So take 9 out and does it for us. So it's got a plus k squared plus 3k plus 3. <coughs> Hence divisible by 9. Okay, so that part, some of that part was harder. Let's be honest with ourselves. But as I said, you can get easy marks by putting the base case and the assumption down, putting something here, just try, making an effort to try to use that assumption. It's pretty much the whole idea. If you try to do that, you might get the whole thing out. If you don't get the whole way, you might get some marks in the process. So this one, the hard part, which I really skipped over, is expanding that thing out, which you do need to do at some point in time. Um, is something you may not know how to do very quickly. Uh, and I realise 
that's why this question wouldn't be very good in your exam for that matter. So this is probably a little bit too hard for where you guys are at. It was fine. Ten odd years ago, if you'd done one more math subject beforehand. So if you start getting a bit worried, worried there, I won't ask this level of difficulty in your exam. But you still need to, but knowing induction is an important thing. And being able to set those sort of steps out. Um, so I said, you've basically got a base case and the conclude and the inductive case, and if well, that's pretty much it. It's more of a show we know what we're doing. Um, therefore, um, e to the k, e to the n is divisible by nine, or n is equal to zero and one and two and three, etc. So for all integers starting from the base case, and there's lots of different ways of saying that. Um, <coughs> so that's really not worth worth any mark, e marks at all. That last line, but that just in came to us, you know what we've actually done. We've actually had finished it. Any questions with that? So as I said, this is where you can pick some marks. Chuck the base case in, put the assumption down, two marks there. Try some steps to try to use that assumption. Just give it a go at it. Um, and then if you can, see if it's pre result. So in the assignment, one, this is more like so typically I want you to, be able to do um, you're doing a series and so the the assumption we were assuming that summing of the first K terms was equal to something or other. The next one was just one more term on the end. And so if you write it down you could clearly see the first K terms there sitting there for you with any expansion required. You could just utilise it. So a bit less algebra was required to be able to see how to use that previous case. That's the sort of level difficulty I would sort of Expect of you guys um, in the main. So I know some, some. I know some individuals far exceed that. Um, others don't. But um, I would like to be able to see if you understand induction or any of these sort of proof techniques in general, rather than getting knocked over just by the algebra or anything possible. And again, we've done several proof techniques, so I should make it clear: you may not get them all, or you won't get them all. You only get. Some of them, but you don't know which they are until you get to the exam. So this one had proof by contradiction and induction. We did do direct and we did contrapositives as well. And and in terms of the first assignment, this was the hardest part of that first assignment, if you remember back that far. Um, so it's okay. Some, not everything is as easy as everything else. But don't give up. Try something. Please do that. If we make a small mathematical error but still somehow managed to prove it true um, even then will we get marks for our working but not for the correct answer yeah yeah um, in this sort of case absolutely um, in the next question two maybe not as I'll explain in a second depending on what the mistake is yeah in that case, I mean, it'd be worth two marks, so it might be zero or two, so there might not be that much leeway. But for these ones, there's quite a few steps. You've made a minor one, and you can do the rest of it okay. You still get most of the marks. So let's have a break for five minutes, and then we'll look at question two. Feel eager. If you if you don't want to stand up and do something, which you guys don't seem to want to do, you can do these questions instead if you want to. But you can stretch your legs. <laughs> 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 someone so quickly. Really? That's <laughs> that was many people run. <laughs> yeah, he, he runs really fast. I should have seen the Olympics. He was smiling at the camera. This cheeky like, hey, hey, hey. Do we, he knew is there any point in making a statement with you guys at all? It's quite hyper hyperbole, isn't it? Is that what Do you know what I mean by hyperbole? Obviously not. Hyperbole, hyperbole. <laughs> he, hyperbole is it, um, exaggeration. Yeah. exaggeration. Yeah. Just can't do anything with you guys. You just, just straight away. I stuff. literally know everything about English. I? That's a hyperbole right there. Oh, got him with the thing I was doing. <coughs> Why 
Why is it? Is it? Is there going to be a long multiplication question in the exam? One of the, one of the key things the subject is um, dealing with different bases. It's okay because I don't see any long. So therefore, I will assess that. It's fine. Sorry. There's no long division questions there, so it's fine. So I. So long, long multiplication. So I'm going to be saying on different bases, but it may not be multiplication. It could be addition or subtraction or. And it tells you I can't remember which one I did. Because so. cause I'm fine with like subtraction and addition, but when you start doing multiplication, <laughs> it's just a pain in the ass. It's not that hard. You just convert it all to regular numbers. But it says it all in out. base 16. Yeah, spit it all out and then convert it back to base 16. It's easy. Using multiplication. Oh, we'll do it in a second. So this is just an example of things you might get. So oh, we get a calculator though. You should do a You are allowed a calculator. The real hero. I wish I had a calculator that worked with non standard bases. Hey, the calculators we have have hex, right? Yeah. Just use that. Some of them do. Yeah, I think the other one. I use has hex. I'm going to cheat. But it does say show all working. So you yeah, I'll just screenshot the calculator, chuck them on the desk. Draw out the calculator screens. Draw out the hex. Right there. On these, on these exam Six. papers, it used to say um, you know, non programmable calculators, no printers allowed. Um, nowadays, calculators tend not to have printers on them. Um, but um, yes, you can't really do a screenshot of them. Mode is So you're right, some calculators, so not the very bottom of the line, Casio doesn't do it. But the next line, the next step up um, does have. So this FX82AU probably doesn't. Probably doesn't. Uh, next one, the next model up, then 100 and whatever it is. Not next one, sure. probably doesn't. So, so this $45 calculator, which I got at the start of high school, which was a requirement for the school, is a piece of rubbish. Well, no, I did not say that. <laughs> well, I did Fantastic. just then, literally just then. Is this the new uh, presidential debate? Because they're really entertaining. Oh my They're my favourite thing to watch. Donald Trump is literally just saying words. It's His not, argument has no point to whatsoever. It's the Donald Trump sniffing compilation and the Hillary, like, just crying compilation. It's very funny. Oh, so funny. Which so, it pretty much sums up every single Trump debate. He just says words. There's no reason or point to his words. That's right. We're not getting much of an intake of the political debate here, though. Sorry. People aren't. People are just pretty neutral. I mean, I'm looking around the room here, Jake, and no one really entering into a conversation. As in, people don't seem to care. It's just a debate between Canadians. It seems to happen whenever I open my mouth. But, you know, it never stops me. Oh, I wasn't trying to go at you. I'm just talking about bullet. I mean, the, I think, I think the whole uh, presidential election thing is very funny. It's hilarious. It, it is a farce. It's right? a one big joke. You know, we got like Hillary, who's a uh, a pretty shady character, the whole emails thing, and then you got Donald Trump the clown. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Well, let's talk about more serious things like um, <laughs> multiplication and hexes. Do, do you mean to say that that is not a serious matter? Like the the four. Who, 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 if who, if, if, if Donald control, Trump becomes president, he said that he wants to like increase the U.S.'s we'll a nuclear armory, basically. And he, and. That's one of the responsibilities of the president to have control of this sort of thing. So, yes, but he wants to like increase it more than it already is. The US have the biggest, not the antique dome, or one of the biggest nuclear armories, arsenals like the world. Yeah, North Korea has the biggest. Yeah, no, it does have very serious implications. Um, it's a shame that it's um, various things are happening in the armories. But anyway, um, back to your exam, which will happen sooner. In the, Presidential. Uh, not not just much, presidential. actually. Not by much. Um, so, question two here is on counting and probability. So, just to show what this one's about, there are some questions on different bases. You can expect the same sort of idea of questions. It may not be, as I said, it may not be base, it may not be hexadecimal, or may not be multiplication, it could be something else, but dealing with different bases is important. Um, you've got counting. As you can see here, and probability, the sort of things we covered. Um, and so your assignment two, which did a line, was this similar sorts of questions to these. Unlike your assignment two, working is required for some of them. 
Yeah. So in particular, um, question two part AI, which we'll do first. <coughs> um, we do need to do some work here. <laughs> so how I'll show you how to do it, so we've got um, one EA times by one zero B. So how we do multiplication the long way, which is what we need to do here, um, is basically take one, go for the bottom number and do one digit at a time. So I'm starting with digit B, just B. So I want to multiply that by each of the successive numbers and write down the results. Um, so, and again, since we know decimal so much better than hexadecimal, we'll have to convert it to decimal least in some sense. So, um, we first have to multiply A by B. What's A in normal L? It's way normal. It's 10. B would be 11. 11. So A times B now thinking is 110. We need to convert that back to hexadecimal. So we need to divide that by 16. Um, so it gives you, uh, I'm guessing, 7. Six. Seven. Yes. So 6, 16 Nine. would be Ten. Yeah. 96. OK, that sounds right. That's better. So again, you just troll an error, or your calculator does what this really well. So you know, 110 divided by 16. It's going to be six point something or other, just try and cut it to give you six. So that's the leading digit. So we'll put that there. We'll have the leading digit we'll need in a second. What's the other digit? So 110 minus 96 gives you 14. We then have to write that down in hexadecimal. And as you said, that's E in hexadecimal. So 110 in hexadecimal is 6E. So I've written an E in a little six up a bit higher, because we'll need to add it to something in a second. That's the first bit. Now I want to do the number long. So now I want to do B times by E. So that's 14 times by 11, which gives you 154. And we have to divide that by 16. Um, mm -hmm. actually, oh, before I do that, let's make it a little easier for ourselves. So B times by E is 14 times 11, which is 154. We then have this 6 we have to add as well. So we'll also add it before we do any else. So Which is 160. So if you divide that by... 16, we have A, 10. So this in hexadecimal is A, 0. Which I'll try to say, yep. Um, so then it's going to be a 0 here with a A being carried. Everyone OK? We're just going too fast, right? Maybe. So let's do the next one. Next one's easier. Next one is just just 1 times by B, which is 11, plus A, which is 10, which gives you 21. And you have to write that there. Actually, divide that by 16. How many 16s go into that? 1 with 5 remainder. So 1, 16 with 5 remainder. And so you've got 1 lot of 16. And five remainder. So in hex has to be written as one five. Just to write that down. So one and a five. So what I've done, I've done one E A times by B gives me one five O E. That's what I've got so far. That's the hardest part of this. As you'll see in a second. Next thing you do is you put a big zero down there. And then you do 0 times by A, 0 times by E, and 0 times by 1, and you get a lot of zeros. So that's pretty easy. Uh, then you put down two zeros, and do the same thing. So you do 1 times by A, 1 times by E, 1 times by 1. So you get it. And multiplying by 1 at least is something I can do without really thinking, fortunately. Is that okay? So the first one really did have to do a lot of extra e effort, but the other ones, multiply by zero and multiply by one, always remain straightforward, fortunately. Multiply by B, a bit harder. So now you've done that, now you can add up all those things. So I've got E plus zero plus zero gives me E. e. Lots zero. 
lots of zeros. Yeah. 5 plus A is 5 plus 10, 15, back in hexadecimal gives me F. And F again. And then, yep. And 1. Yep. And that's the answer. So you can see the hard part was just getting that first line done. So, a bit involved, I mean, there's a bit involved there. As I said, I might give you a similar question, I might give you an easy one. Up to you, uh, you'll find out today. You can use your calculator to help you, as you can see there. Um, and so, the things I'm looking, so, you need to do need to show these three things in the middle here, that's wherever it might be in the middle, as the intermediate working. And I've also showed the things I'm carrying at the top there. That sort of standard working, this sort of stuff. Okay, next one. Explain how to convert numbers easily between base 2 and base 16. It's a binary and hexadecimal. So I won't write it down, you can just guys can tell me. How do you convert from binary to hexadecimal? Well, I'd convert it to decimal. So then binary to. Okay, so one way to go by decimal, which I suggest is the bad way of doing it. That's, uh, but that's rude. Well, it does say easily. I know. But it's easily for me. Yeah. Well, it's not that hard. What's easily for you? So, converting things from base to the decimal to hexadecimal. So, what's another way of going from um, binary to hexadecimal? Uh, Math. Putting the bits I don't know, using, using binary. Sometimes it's useful to write it using them nibbles. Yeah. Nibbles. Okay, so that's a that's a binary number. So how do you write that? As, how do you write that as hexadecimal? Uh, that's a solid uh, twelve, which is a, a C. Okay. So if you write a, if you had a longer number, well, what you do is you get each four bits as a nibble, and then you convert that to hexadecimal. Okay. So you, that's right. So you block basically. Break them up into blocks of four, and each block of four you just convert that into the corresponding hexadecimal number. So to be, what this one then? Sorry? 1C. One 1C. One so the top block's one, the second block's C. And in order to answer the question, you might you could might, might find it easier to use an example or you use text. So you probably have to write down something, a sentence here to do it. So base 2 to base 16, just block them up into groups or whatever on the base, so 4 in this case, and convert each accordingly. Uh, next one is converting from um, decimal to some other base. What's the basic process? How do we convert? Any, how do we convert any decimal into any other base? Just divide it by the base. Yeah. So you just keep dividing it by the base. The you need to keep track of the remainder because that'll be the bottom. Each, the remainder just is the bottom digit, next bottom digit, etc. So the remainder is just all the digits effectively. And whatever you left, the, the quotient, the thing you get left with, it'll just keep dividing by. So we're going to keep dividing by five. So you divide that number by five, what do you get? You can use your calculator. 778. Uh, with the, and we'll put the remainders here, and the remainder is going to be one. Now how do I work that out? Put out your calculator, you can easily divide by five. If you divide it by five, you're going to get 778.2. And so the 778 is right down, that's easy. Yep. Um, and if you need to, you can just do 3891 minus 5 times 778 equals and tells you the remainder. You never need to do that. I mean, since we're dividing by 5 here, um, you might recognise the fractions at the end as well. So I want to divide by 5 another time. So you get remainder three, and you get five, fourteen, something like that. 
155, I think it is. You gotta get who's got a capo on them who can Yeah that that's right. Sorry. It's good to practice, but don't trust me on it. Divide my five again, gives you thirty one, remainder zero. Zero. Divide my five gives you six remainder one. Six remainder one. Well five. One remainder one. And zero remainder one. Yep. And then all the remainders of the number. So the number is reading from the bottom up. One, 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 zero, three, one. And base five. So that's the number there. So just keep dividing by the base over and over again. And the remainders tell you what all the digits are. You can do it by dividing anything else. You can do it binary two. So if you're doing it dividing by two, the, dem the remainders are much easier to work out. So you're just getting zeros and ones. Um, but you might as well use your calculator to help you out as much as you can. You're OK with that process? So here, these next two questions are of accounting. Um, in your assignment two, we did questions like this. Um, the other thing we did was we did probability questions of the same sort of nature. Again, they're fine to be asked in your exam. Um, we also, in your, your assignment two, we did probability based on um, distributions, which is what this last question is. Again, that's fine. Um, we also did distributions on binomial and Poisson as well. So they're also a big game. So make sure you know them all. I can't ask everything, but just like this sample exam shows you, I can't ask everything, but I can ask any of those. So be prepared for them. Okay, so let's give it a go with these. Have a read them all. What do you guys reckon? <coughs> so have a go. Write down, write down when you reckon the answers are on your piece of paper. So, key things to think about, these sort of questions, um, I've got three selected from five. So, I, this idea of selecting people is important. There's sort of two ways of selecting them. You can either select them where you care about the order, or you don't care about the order. If you care about the order, you get a, what's called a permutation. If you don't care about the order, you get a combination. So, you get one of the two here. So is this a combination or a permutation then? Combination. But in this case, you just want a group of people, so I really don't care. And so we're going to do a combination. And we want to, from our five, we want to choose three of them. So that's a five choose three bit. The other part would give you something similar, which is? 12 choose seven. 12 choose seven. So the first thing you have to think about is if it's a combination or a permutation. And you calculate and know the formulas for both of them in case you want to know. Um, you have to combine them. So is it plus or multiplication? Plus would be all, one or the other. And a multiplication is one and the other. So it's an and or an or, essentially. So do we want the three guys and the seven women both to be selected at the same time, or just one or the other? Together at the same time, so it would be multiplication. So it's multiplication. 
We want both at the same time, so therefore multiplications required. Which is a bloody big number. And that's and writing that down would be okay. Um, you want to get a proper answer, use your calculator. Okay. Next one is definitely harder. Um, any idea? That's going to be done in a certain way, so it would be okay. zero, 01010101 one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, blah, blah blah six times times by the this size <laughs> different ways than the ones, so it would be five. I think I better put you out of your misery in this too in the answer. <laughs> The group, let's think, what, what, the, what groups are we going to have here? Do we have a bunch of groups? We're going to have six groups of zero ones and four groups of just ones, like just four ones. Yeah. So we've got ten different groups, essentially. Four, six of them look like zero one, another four of them look like one. Um, and we just may want to order those, essentially. That's what we want to do. Um, so... The number of ways, so the number of strings, two different ways of doing it. First approach is let's order these 10 groups. How many different ways are there of ordering 10 groups? 10 factorial. 10 factorial. However, yeah, there's six of the first group, so they're all indistinguishable, so we can reorder them as much as we want to and look exactly the same. So we would need to divide by the number of ways of ordering those six groups. What else do we have to do? And then multiply by the four factorial. So I'll have to also divide and put on the bottom another four factorial. So I have to divide by the number of ways of ordering those four ones as well. So if you remember, we did similar things um, like um, we had words with repeated letters. I can't remember off the top of my head. There was also one in a way which you could order the children so that they were together, otherwise they'd fight. Yeah. So we had the word like selected. How many different ways of writing words of the letters selected on in a line? And there's there's a bunch of there's a few ways they're repeated. So we have to order that. You order the, all the letters, but you have to realise that each is changed. You have to divide by the number of e's that are present. So we did other things like putting taking photos of families, as you said. We had to group the kids together or group them apart and things like that. So it's the idea of that grouping. So similar ideas. That's one way of doing it. Um, the other way of doing the question, which is exactly the same way, really, and that is to say, I've got ten positions. I would like four of them to be where the ones are and the other six positions to be zero, one. So of my ten positions, I would like to choose four of them to be where the one is. And it's the same number. That's the other way of doing it. So, I don't know what you find easier, but that's the sort of um, reasoning behind that. Um, you'll probably get it right or wrong. It's pretty hard to get half marks for that. Um, and again, that's harder, let's be honest with ourselves. Like, that's one of the that's sort of harder ones to do. <coughs> but just different ways of trying to think through it, etc. But you can see, so some of the ideas that, although this question might be difficult, the things that you do need to understand is try to group things together. And the idea of sorting, putting lots of things down, is that idea of factorial that you can see cropping up. So things I think you need to know is combinations, permutations, what the factorial does, and they're sort of key ideas. Um, the basic idea of probability, Poisson, binomial, and the, very much the stuff in the next question, which I'll do. No. 
So we've got a soy probability density function. So probability tail essentially. And to find all these different probabilities out for it. Uh, what would be useful for these tables is to work at the totals. So I'll put that out. So um, the total of the first column is 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 0 0.2, and then tiling of the rows um, looks remarkably similar because it's symmetric. So that's just the various totals. So they, they're useful for our, our purposes. Okay. First one is what's the probability that x is 0 and y equals 4? 0.6. And the answer is 0.6. So we want to do both of them at the same time. It's just about reading the value off from the table. That's all it is. It's got a joint probability, so just pick a number on the table. Um, or? Also 0.6. Okay. So how you work this out more in general terms, because that's, it can easily be more, it doesn't necessarily need to be the same. What I would do for this situation is it's either the numbers that correspond to x equals 0 or the numbers that correspond to y equals 4. So I would add up, in general, add up all those numbers. Uh, make sure I don't count the one in the middle twice. That's the bigger flight you can make. So add up all those numbers. So 0, lots of four zeros plus 0 0.6, add them up, you get 0.6. So that's, that's the other way of doing it. And there are time savers using the titles if you needed to. Um, probability that y equals 3, well, that would correspond to those numbers there. So just add them up. 0.2. Okay, there's no point finding the answer down. You need to understand how it, how it got there. Next one, how do you read that last one? Isn't it probably y equals 3 given x equals y? What did you say, Miles? Yep, so this line here can be written as given, like Jacob said, or such that. They're both acceptable. So given is the way I prefer to say it, but such that, same thing. So what's probably y equals 3 such that x equals 1? So that tells me that we know we're in this column. We're definitely in that column. That's the given bit, so that's what we're given. If you're in that column, what's the probability that y equals 3? Well, the way to work out probabilities is you work out the probability of something happening. Well, y equals 3 happens 0.1 of the time. And then we have to divide it by the total probability. And we only get in that column 0.2 of the time. So that would be the conditional probability. So in general terms, in sort of table format like this, a conditional probability would be something in a table divided by a margin. I mean the margin. Practice. And what's that, what's that equal to? Uh, yeah. So a half or 50%, any of those were equivalent to each other. So the last two here are E and V. So E is the expected value and V is the variance. So it's just over X's. So let's just write the table a bit more simply. The X values um, are these ones here. And we've got the various probabilities. So that's our um, summary for the X stuff here. So, in order to work out the expected value, there's a formula for it, and it's just adding up um, all the different values times by the probability of getting them. That's the basic formula. Um, so, here it is here. Spell that more. So that's the formula, the formula we've got here. So the expected value, or called the average, is summing over x times by the probability of happening. So what that means in practice, I would just work out um, what x times by p is for all the different values. So I do minus 1 times by 0.2 gives me minus 0.2. 0 times by 0.6 gives me 0. 
1 times by 0.2 gives me 0.2, and then add them up. So it's going to add up all those three numbers. So if you add up those three numbers, what do you get? Zero. 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 So the expected value in this case is zero. So the average value for x is zero. Next thing you want to do is work out the, the variance. So I have two different ways of doing it. One is to sum up x minus this average squared times by the probability of happening. That's one way of doing it. Um, the other way of doing it is just to summing up x squared times by the probability of it happening. So just work out that thing separately. And then subtract off the average squared. And they're the same thing. They give you the same answer. And again, the formal sheet, um, the, that's variability. You can, I've written them both down. Um, that's all that, and that's what that means. If that doesn't make sense to you, and you're printing this out, scribble down what it makes sense to you on the, over the top of it. So in this case, um, this latter form normally is easier to do with, so let's do that one. So what I need to do is I need to work out x squared first. So there's square all of them. So what's the square values for all of them? So 1, 0, and 1. And then I want to work at x squared times by p, because we want to sum up. So I want to do 0.2 times by 1 is 0.2. 0 0.6 times 0 is still 0. 0.2 times 1 is 0.2. And add them up. If I add them up, I get 0.4. 0 0.4. And so the variance then is that sum, 0.4 minus the average. What's the average again? 0. 0 minus the average squared, or just 0.4. And then the standard deviation, if you want to know that, would be the square root of it. The square root of 0.4, whatever that is, um, would be the um, standard deviation. And I need to calculate it at that point in time. Um, and that's a measure of how spread out it is. Um, and if, and this, that's normally useful in terms of comparing other things. So is it more or less spreading than other distributions or whatever it might be? So the things you need to know is, as you can see here, um, and or marginal conditional probabilities, expected values and variances. So that's a bit of everything. In your exam, you may not get them more. So it's useful to better know them more. And so on the formula sheet, I have written down the formulas for mean and variance there. They're the main key. The now, they may not be written in a way that you understand, so rewrite them in the way you understand. Yeah, that's, that's, that's no good. Yeah. But it's your sheet, so you can do with what you want. It's a lot of gobbledygook. So make it less good. So the mean is x. Is the, ex the, e, the mean is the expected value. That's why I wrote it out. So mean is the oh, expected value the, of x. What's the z one? It's that's the standard. That's the standard score. It's Z in this country. Z. That's the standard score. So the standardised score is the value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Uh, and it's also called the Z score. Z. Which people? So yeah, uh, the other one. No, it's Australian. We use these two formulas as well in lectures. Um, so make sure you know you yeah, utilise them as well. I mean, there's no examples here, but it's not British English. Yes, I know. We say that like that in Australia as well. Okay. So let's just have a glance at the rest of the paper before we do do any more questions. So question three is on graph theory. So produce a graph, ask to know if it's traversable, adjacency matrix, work out something with lengths. Um, then it's got like trees, um, moron trees. So B and C are both tree questions. And the weakest question in that, the assignment and graph theory was um, that question like B part I, I think was probably the weakest question done in that assignment across the board. So some people might have done it really well. but um, So more about trees. Then D here was um, minimal spanning tree. So, hmm? 
Well, not yet. So find the minimal spending tree for that diagram. Uh, it doesn't actually say that in the question, does it? But it is a minimal spending tree question. Um, so with graph theory questions like this one here, yeah, it's a bunch of, it's an algorithm to follow. So cross schools or Prim's algorithm are the two, two main ones you'd follow here. Um, now the clearest way would be to have a diagram for every single edge you add to the add to, to build up your middle spanning tree. Um, that takes a bit of paper, and so I understand if you want to save you a bit of space. And so in this sort of instance, maybe write down the... I mean, you have one working diagram that you have that you're going to add things onto, and keep a list of the, what, the, the edges you've added and in the order you've added them. Just make it really clear what algorithm you've done. So if you're doing... What, what edge would you add in first if you're doing this sort of thing for minimal spending tree? One of the ones. Yeah, so you just add one of the cheapest cheapest costs. So you have one of the ones. It doesn't really matter which one you pick. And you go, that's what I'm adding first. And the next one would be... So if you had, The other one of the ones. So it depends on your method. So if you're doing um, cross schools method, you just... you know, It can be disjoint. So you pick, another, you pick the three ones of the first three edges. That's what I would do. If you're doing prims, which just keeps it connected as you're going along... Um, you start with a one here, for example, and you just do the cheapest cost that's coming connected to it, which would be the two, for example. Go on. And so you can use either method, they both give you the correct one. But make it clear what your working is, and that's, that's the key thing. And the other algorithm which is similar to this is, oh, another graph theory algorithm, is the Ford and Falkerson's method, which is the maximal flow. Again, just be clear what your working is. And with Ford and Fox, and you're often rubbing out the, you're often changing the numbers on the, um, the labels on the, um, you're often changing the labels on the graph. And so if you're doing that lots, it might be best, instead of getting big scribbles, maybe write the diagram a few times. Maybe do two pass or three pass on one graph if you can see it. Um, but you make it clear to the marker, especially if you're making a mistake early on, it might be hard to work out. Well, if you make my mistake early on, it might be hard to work out how much you really understand. So breaking up in a few cases makes it easier for the market to see, I think. So certainly for that, for Ford and Fox, don't go overboard by putting an all-in diagram because you, it's a bit of a risky situation. So that's the graph theory one. I will do some more questions in detail. Um, question four is a bit like that assignment you've just done. Oh, that's the part I had to do in the assignment. <laughs> What was the deal with question two? Let's be real. Yeah, what was Straight the deal? Up. What? It was so terrible. What? <laughs> um, and it, it was, was only worth like six marks. Yeah. Like, it was the biggest pain in the ass of that assignment and it was worth <laughs> six marks. But it was worth more, did you? Or? No, I, I just, just, I just didn't know do why it. it was such a pain in the ass for only six marks. I just gave up. So, uh, the reason why I put it in there was I was trying to show you the application of... Uh, the recursive, so that recurrence relations to finding out the time flow of actual functions. That's what well, it, it didn't work. No, I can tell you that. No. Just, I just skipped it. I was like, well, I didn't, don't know. How Did anyone here time. completely finish question two? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, be, if you couldn't do question A and B, give me some hope for this class. Did anyone actually finish question two? Do you know do part C? You can do part C and D. Oh, yeah, that was easy. Yeah, like, like correctly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, finished it, then not correct. Yeah. Oh, well. So I feel as though that might have been a pretty bad question. Oh, I had good intentions, but I I write this assignment, that assignment, four weeks before the start of session, so... Yeah. yeah. Maybe they'll it's turn to Einstein's before we get... So it's hard to work out. Hmm? I'll throw that question in. Well, maybe they'll gain some knowledge from some magic or something. Let's just write that in real quick. Yeah. Just here. You just write, like, the second question was ridiculously hard compared to the other ones. I was trying to get applications as well as we do. And the thing is, getting app applications aren't always easy. That's the thing. Like, just because you, some things that are real life, authentic problems aren't always nice. Switch up the marking allocation then, because the last question was worth half the assignment. It was not the last one was 19 marks, and then six, and then 15. Well, 
I knew, I mean, I knew it was asking for hard stuff, so therefore I didn't want to penalise people heavily for it. Like damage control. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Anyway. <laughs> Oh, it's question, fine. It's question, okay to have some hard questions. It's okay. Yeah. Question three, if you took the time to read it and like analyse the question properly, it was really easy. But then question two, no matter how oh. much time you spent analysing it and trying to understand it, it was still <laughs> terrible. I think Paul was crying. Yeah. You, that's usually me how, how do I feel with that? All right, well. I think you were just overthinking it, though, Paul. Um, I think it's mad. <laughs> I don't know. If people really want, I mean, people still, not everyone's put the assignment in for various reasons. Um, like, some people got extensions, some people are, are submitting it late, so I won't tell you the answers for question two yet. Um, but I'll do so later. Can you do like a similar question? Like, not exactly the same, of course, but like a similar style of question to show you. We, we haven't really, really done that many similar style questions or any similar style questions. The, the most similar one we did was Towers of Annoying. Yeah, so what was with that least that integer thing? thing? Yeah, we didn't like We that. never covered least integer in class, no. no not in the lecture and slides at all. Neither did Jono, neither Paul, it's not in the lecture slides. <laughs> when we the lecture slides could not find anything. And I, I googled least integer stuff and it came up with some pretty strange things that weren't really related to that. <laughs> now, you're overthinking it, I think. So... Oh, I'll talk about it later. I mean, the, as the find the still least integer something something and I was like, what? Um, like it was one of those things that never covered in class, so it made no sense. And I tried to underthink it and overthink it. And just well, I'll do. It. I'll do a similar question. So, so back to this yeah, the exam in front of us, and I'll go to your question. You do need to know how to do solving recurrence relations. So this particular exam forced you to use a generating function, as you can see here. Um, I won't. Just, I've said it a few times. Um. um the difference between part A and part B in this case is part... You just said in the our exam we won't be forced to use... The generating function up. method. We, we get the choice to use whichever for all the questions related to it. Okay. Yep. Cool. So therefore, it's if you feel like not learning the generating function method and just the characteristic equation method, that is okay. Like, someone asked me a point back the other day and that's true. So you can just focus on just one. So if you wanted to, you could just do the generating function method, but I suspect most people would prefer the other one. Um, so um, this first one here has di two distinct roots. This one here has a double root. Um, that's the difference between those two questions. Um, and it's important to add in both. So pretty much the same assignment. Yeah. Um, so these are the big O ones here. And so the, the focus I wanted to have in this subject was more the heuristics. Um, so let's do two things. Let's just put a, let's answer the question as written, and then we'll answer the question like this at least inches of stuff. Um, basically, let's put these functions in um, in order of um, big O notation. So what's the smallest? Yeah, smallest. Is it log n? So log n, yep. So log's checked anything else. Just one mark. And then, and then I'm going to say square root n. Yep, root n. Ten to the half, yep. n squared. Oh, that's what Corey. And then n cubed plus n squared plus 2. The n cubed thing, yep. And Let's put on lines once we're done. And then is it two to the n? Plus, so no, just two to the n. And then two to the n plus n squared, and then three to the n. So they're the same. Complexity class. The n squared. But they're big theta of each other. It's 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 still, it still would go slightly more technically. In terms of order of complexity, so they're actually the same, they're the equivalent, they're equivalent class. So in actual function, the one with plus n squared would be ever slightly longer. So yes. Um, then three to the n. So when you order, so basically you've got in logs cheaper than anything else, then you're putting polynomials down, um, then you're doing exponentials, and you, when you're sorting exponentials, it's really in terms of the base. So two's become four, three, three, etc. Then n factorial. Then n factorial, 
and then N to the N. What about 2 to the N? Hmm? I've already done that. I've already done that. Oh, it is. Right. Don't worry, I'm, that out. I'm blind, okay? Okay. You got the one that said that. Um, and so the, I'll, wait, I'll mark this, if there's a question like this down, mark it the same way in your assignment. So the number of, if you in, transpose pairs. So it's the number of pairs that are right. Now, what about this least integer bit? So let's um, find the big O class N to something or other for each of these. And I'll find the, the smallest one I possibly can for it. So this is in big O... Of what? So I mean, yes, it's been big of log of n, but if I have to specify n to some power, what power would you pick? So I would it I mean this is, log n is in big of n squared, it's in big of n cubed, it's in all of them. But the best, the the smallest power I can pick, so that log of n is in it, is o to the n, o to the n. So I can't be smaller than that, so it's not constant time. So the best I can do is linear. Um, what the next one? What's the smallest power of n? I've root that square root of n is in it. Is it this n again? Yep. So again, it's sublinear. Um, next one. So n squared is in n squared. So that's okay. Next one being cubed, um, and the rest of them um, are not polynomial time. So, um, so three D N, for example, is not in big O of N to the A for any A. So there's no polynomial I can think of at all that three D N would be in the O class. So three D N grows faster than any polynomial function at all. So that's the reason that's why we put the order. So we've got these are the polynomial ones. That's polytime. Polytime. So or the P the set of the class of P functions. So P is the abbreviation for it all. So exponential um, grows faster than any polynomial we can think of, any of them. So therefore, any exponential cannot be in big O of any polynomial class at all. It's just always bigger than any of them we can think of. So that's the idea of that least integer. I'm just trying to find the just big O of n to some power. I'm trying to make that power as small as I possibly can. And you can see here, I've got n squared here. I can't make it smaller because we got in the first place. Well, there's a limit. You can't go further down. And so logs are cl very close to constant time, but they are more than that. So you have to go up to linear time to be above it. So this idea of big O is the is an R, is the idea of less than or equal to. So log n is sort of less than n in that sort of sense in terms of complexity. And root n again is less than n. You're trying to find the least upper bound idea. Um, so the last question five um, is about the Boolean algebra, so stuff that we've done more recently. So you can see um, there's proving things. Um, the easiest way to prove part two is to use the duality, so knowing that's important, that's helpful. Uh, you can use had to simplify pitch things down, so using rules, etc. Um, proving things, and again, I think our stuff is giving a, um, a, fun, a, fun, a Boolean sort of function, being able to simplify it down and writing a circuit for it. And a simplification using, say, Carnot maps, for example. So not that it was required, and you can simplify it other ways as well. So that's the sort of questions you can expect. What was that? I'm oh, just looking at that little table and it's basically just Z. It's X. Oh, sorry. No. Wait. Almost. It's, 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 it's almost. <laughs> almost. Almost. The X and then probably Y not. Or Y not Z. So, um, 
we've got a lecture tomorrow, so I can do some more of those questions tomorrow. Um, I won't fit in, do them all in tomorrow's They're lecture. Because um, you can do them quicker than I can talk through them. Um, the last question I'll just finish up on today, and then we'll do the rest tomorrow, is... What's a shape? Oh, it's a graph. Um, this one here. So this is um, a tree pen. So I've got an expression. I want to turn this into an expression tree. So the reason why I'm picking this one, as I alluded to earlier, this was the the question that people least understood in terms of the assignment three. So to work in an expression tree, basically the root node of an expression tree corresponds to the last operation you do. So all operations is bid mass. So you do brackets first and um, indexes, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, that's what it stands for. So there's lots of brackets here. So you do the brackets first. So what, what really happens is then the last thing you would do is that multiplication. That's the last thing you do. So that would become the root node in this case. And then off it would be the corresponding expression for it. So do one on the right, it looks a bit easier. So you've got E minus F. So there's only one operation. So the last thing you do is that subtraction. It's the only thing you have to do. And it's subtracting E and F. On the right-hand side, we've got some additions and a division there. Um, so what's the last thing you do in that expression here? The division. So how it's written down is there are actually our implied brackets, how you write it down that way. So again, you, because of the brackets, the last thing you do is the division. And so the first thing you're dividing is A plus B, which is a plus A and a B. And the second thing you're dividing is C and a D. So that would be expression change. So for each one, last operator can pick up the root and then just keep doing it recursively. So now I want to try to traverse this tree. And I want to get reverse polish. Um, so reverse polish means, you know how you do that? That's post order. So you're going to post order search. So that means do left and then right and then your root note. Um, visually, you start near your root node and just keep going around. Every time you pass onto the afterwards, the right hand side of it, you pick it up. So you're going here, you got the A first. So you keep going round. You pass by the right of the B, that's the next one. Then you pass by the right of the plus. Then you pass by the right of the C, right of the D, and, and this plus sign, and the divide sign and the E, then the F, then the minus, and lastly, pass by the multiplication symbol. That would be the post-order traversal, doing it all visually. Um, you can do it, you know, like a computer would, and um, more recursively, and goes, it does, keeps going, does left, right, and then parent. So the first thing you go is just keep going as left as you possibly can with the very first thing you do, which would be the A again. You go backwards. That's called a reverse polish notation. So more of the part I want to focus on. So we'll do the rest of the question.